I'm going to review some, uh, very quickly review uh, some housekeeping matters. Uh, this presentation is part of a uh, part of the Groton at Work program, and it was organized by the Groton Public Library, and was made possible by a grant uh, from the Connecticut Work Initiative at the uh, uh, Connecticut Humanities. If most of you have already seen out front, there are a series of photographs as part of the grant money uh, that we received. Also. Uh, now, Barbara Nagy uh, gave a presentation on the electric boat, which was quite interesting, and the posters around the room give you an idea of, of that particular program. When we were asked to kind of contribute into this program for the library, uh, Barbara decided to do the industrial aspect of it, uh, which was the electric boat, and I felt it was important, we had Groton at work, that most of Groton at work relved around mom and pop stores and small uh, industries or small businesses. So that's what uh, the display is about out there. But I also did the same thing with Thames Street. Now, last uh, two weeks ago, we left off. We started at the, uh, where the old state police barracks is, where the uh, submarine memorial is, and, and worked our way south. Uh, to this particular intersection here, School Street and Thames Street. And this is where a lot of the businesses, uh, we'll call it the center hub of Thames Street's businesses, as well as the transportation hub of Thames Street or Groton Bank uh, was located. That's where the ferry boat landing was. And that's where we left off two weeks ago. The ferry boat is right across the way from what we remember as the sportsman's bar uh, is now vacant, has been vacant for quite a few years. Now, this particular area of School Street, Thames Street, and Ferry Street is a small street that goes down to the ferry slip, and it is indeed named Ferry Street, and uh, it belonged to New London at one time, and uh, now uh, we own it. And it is the transportation, or was the transportation and business hub of Groton Bank. I don't say all of Groton because we had Mystic uh, that was very active also in, in businesses. This is where the ferry slip was once located. It is now the Thames Inn, a boat motel. Over to the left area is actually where the ferry slip was located. The hotel was built in the early 70s, at which time there were some storefronts up toward the area on Thames Street to the right of this hotel. And that particular lot there was vacant. So that was our parking area. So we were very fortunate that, at that point to have this location for the business people. Uh, now, unfortunately, we don't have the parking available. And it has contributed, I feel anyway, to a, a sort of diminishing of our uh, businesses on that street. Hopefully, with the revitalization of Thames Street, which most of you are aware is taking place now, uh, that we will uh, encourage other businesses to come back. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, I went on, into a directory 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we had 89 businesses on Thames Street. We're now down to 17 to 20. So we're hoping to bring that back with the revitalization of, of the street. There's the area that led down into the ferry slip. At one time, it was a very bustling area. Uh, we had a coal yard back here. Prior to the coal yard, we had a monumental builder that would build cemetery stones and other monuments. This is actually the second post office in Groton. The first one was in the Bailey house. Uh, Mr. Bailey uh, used to go to New London and pick up the mail. So as you can see, the horse and wagon waiting for the ferry to come in from New London. This was a busy, busy transportation mode. There's another day, a typical day, of people going onto the ferry. You can see the line of vehicles going all the way back up Thames Street. You'll notice this gentleman here. The reason why this gentleman is sitting here, there'll be another photograph. There's a Chinese laundry right on the corner there. And of course, there were several ferry boats that would run back and forth. Uh, one of the more interesting aspects was the fact that we used to have horse ferries, where they actually had teams of four to six horses that would run on a wheel and convert into, into a paddle. And then they tried the steam engines. Uh, the first steam engine was too big. So they went back to the horses, and then they went to the, to the steam engine, ultimately. This is also some of the vehicles that would use the ferry. 
They would charge so much for the wagon, whether it had two, four, or six oxen pulling it. It didn't make a difference. They would charge just for the wagon. And that building, by the way, that's the sportsman bar, and as you can see, the waiting room for the ferry boat. And here's another angle of a different team of oxen looking north onto Thames Street, heading down toward the bridge. Ultimately, besides the oxen and the vehicles, we ended up having a major stop for the trolleys. The School Street area was actually the turnaround area in Groton for quite a while, where the trolley would run all the way over to Westerly. Ultimately, when the first railroad bridge was converted into a vehicle bridge, they placed trolley tracks on that, and then the trolley would go over to New London. And that's kind of scary to see something like that coming down Thames Street. But they were frequent, and if you do research, if you go back in the newspapers, the number of accidents that transpired on that street was unbelievable. And I don't say this facetiously, but you see what's on the front of that. That's the cow catcher. We did have cattle coming in and out. And I remember I mentioned about the laundry. There's the laundry there. Now, I found this photograph. I wasn't aware that I had it. It's taken from about halfway down School Street, looking toward the river. And what I want to bring out here is the fact that this is a transportation hub. So I zeroed in on the buildings on the right here, and you'll notice there's a livery, and that they also make carriages right here. And then you see the trolley, and then you see the horse and wagon. So it is a transportation hub. It's a central location for all sorts of transportation. Now we're going to look south down Thames Street from that intersection, School Street, Thames Street, and Ferry Street. Uh, that's pretty much what it looks like today. That's what it looked like around eight years ago. And personalizing the program, my family, specifically my sister, uh, runs the fish and tackle store on the corner here, Ken's Tackle Shop. Unfortunately, in 2008, there was a major fire that, that uh, destroyed the store. It was quite a fire. The fireman did an excellent job saving the buildings to the left. That's what it looks like today. And it's unfortunate the owner of that particular building had one year to utilize the same footprint to reconstruct it, and you drove down there today. That's pretty much what it looks like. But going back in time, this was the first building. Carlos W. Allen, Groceries and Provisions. When you look at these pictures, look around these pictures because they're, they're quite interesting when you start seeing some of the lights. There's Mr. Allen, Carlos Allen in the center of the store. See the pot belly stove? Take a look at this gentleman here. I can't think of his name offhand, but he lived on Broad Street. And there he is in front of his house on Broad Street with a delivery vehicle for Carlos Allen. Just as we know about transportation moving up and changing all the time, but Mr. Allen went to the next level. That's taken, that photograph was taken down in Eastern Point. Now, there were other businesses in that same building, in the lower section on the right side of the building as you go down for the ferry slip. Uh, Robert Dennison had a paint shop. And before the paint shop, we had a pool hall. Now, another interesting thing, other uses. This is the ferry landing. And this particular portion of that Carlos Allen building was used for church services. Those familiar with Groton, with Morton Plant, it was used before Morton Plant had a church built for his workers who were Catholic. And that was the Catholic church that was across the street from the main gate of the electric boat which is now the three-deck parking garage. But prior to them building this church, or Morton Plant providing the money to build that church, as he said, for a place for my workers to worship, uh, they would hold services uh, down at the ferry slip. Here's another look down Thames Street, facing south. Now you can see Carlos Allen's is now the first national store. And we have all the little stores going down. This is the main block looking north. And we recognize a few of the stores there. That's what it looked like around the turn of the century. Didn't change much, did it? After the major fire at the Carlos Allen building, my sister opened up uh, a few stores up, Thames Street. Most of us remember it as the J&G Meat Market. I know when we first moved over to the, to the city, my wife and I would go down and buy a, a quarter side of, of beef and have it cut up and put it in the freezer, get a cheaper rate that way. I'm going to go back to this picture because I'm, the next slide is it's interesting. We're going to go full cycle. So now, this picture was taken around the turn of the century, so we're talking over 100 years ago. I discovered this by enlarging these photographs. There's a sign down there, and if you can read it, Fisherman's Supplies. 
and my sister has a fishing tackle store there now, a hundred years later. So we went full cycle in a hundred years. Paul's Pasta. You talk to a lot of people that you say, I come from Groton. Is it near Paul's Pasta? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, that's what Paul's Pasta used to be. It's come in poppies. It started out as a, as a boot store, and then uh, Mr. Edgecombe had it for a while, and then uh, Edgecombe and Poppy went in together. Mr. Edgecombe died, and Mr. Poppy, who was the town's clerk for a while, he was also a tax collector in the borough, and I believe he was uh, one of the first selectmen back then. That's Mr. Poppy. Interestingly, he used to predict the weather with bugs, and a lot of the fishermen, commercial fishermen, would go to his store and relied upon his predictions and felt they were pretty accurate. And as a side story, one of the other things he had to do is on Equinox, I guess that's this week, is it, the 21st? Okay. He'd have to see which way, the, which direction the wind was blowing. So someone would have to go up to the Fort Grizzle in the middle of the night and hold their finger up. And it was oftentimes the policeman that did that. <laughs> now that's then, and that's uh, uh, Mr. Edgecombe standing in front of the store. And now we have Paul Fidget standing in front of the store. And Paul has a postcard he hands out that has the now and then picture, and the customers love it. Now we're going to go a little bit to the south of Paul's, and there's a retaining wall there. Some of you may recall a few years ago where we had a major rainstorm and the road actually gave out. That's what was there around the turn of the century, Groton Grain. There was also a meat market, the Ferry Meat Market. When Groton Grain first started out, it was these two buildings, and then they added the other buildings to go along with it. That's when they started selling coal down there. Remember, all these little stores are employing people. Albert, as small as it may be, one or two people, we're talking the mom and pop stores. There's a close-up of it. That's the owner, Abed Hewitt. And I spoke to Mr. Hewitt a few years ago, and he named every one of them in that photograph. My father opened up the store there, and shortly after they moved down to the Carlos Allen building, there was a major structural fire there. Now, Donnie Biles didn't have a monopoly on funeral homes. A lot of people don't realize this. Across the street, there was Gauthier's Groton Funeral Home. And he was quite a guy. Uh, I only recall one, maybe two funerals being held there. And uh, most of the time, he was about this tall and about this wide. And he drove a taxi cab. <laughs> and that's where you would see Mr. Gauthier. There was also a uh, Dr. Barnum uh, used to be in this building here. This is the former Thames Surplus Army Navy store. This is what it looks like today. Uh, what that used to be, though, was the Cohen Bailey store. And you can see the workers out front, again, taken around the turn of the century. Interestingly, if you look at this sign here, is Groton's first YMCA. And in the 60s and 70s, when I was on the police department, it was the Groton Hotel. And then ultimately, uh, Morgan and White went down below and opened up all those stores uh, where my father's store used to be. Quite a crew. And that's Mr. Bailey. Now, if we take that store and you look toward the river, this was the second ferry boat landing. The first one across the way from the Avery Cop House Museum. And then it moved to here. And then after that, this became a major coaling station or coaling supplier. But in our time, a lot of us will remember this. GM Long Fish Company. And at the peak, they had approximately 25 employees working for them. So it was a large uh, company. GM Long came from Maine. I wanted to take a look where that arrow is. There's a building there. GM Long used it for, to store their ice to keep the uh, fish fresh. After that, this became the Groton Iron and Brass Company. Uh, it was a foundry. Only stayed in business for like six months because he couldn't find employees that could do the labor that he needed to do. So ultimately, he moved up to the Springfield area of Massachusetts. Today, that's the building that's now used for storage. Now we're going to take another look south again, where Rotten Grain was. And you can look at the variety of stores that are here. 
as another Chinese laundry here. And interestingly, this building here is a bar. And I talked to a former mayor years ago, Don Sweet, and he recalls there were several of these on the street. And you would go in and grab a quick beer and then leave. It was just a, just a hole in the wall. That's what it was there for. You went in, and it wasn't like you were sitting there watching the football games or something on television. You went in, got a quick beer, and off you went. This building, where that arrow is, wasn't always there. The building moved. Remember the ferry meat market that I mentioned earlier? That's the building. Now, the ferry meat market was run by Robert E. Fitch and his father. But the building was moved to where, where Ralph's is today. And I found this article. It was moved on April 4, 1912. But I want you to read the yellow portion. Uh, Carmelo Rigalabuto, who conducts a tesorio parlor, which is a barber shop, by the way. My wife and I looked that up today. Right? Uh, in the building, went right on shaving his customers without a hitch. His customers stepped on and off the moving building as they would from any slowly moving trolley car, and business suffered very little by the work of the removal. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to be sitting in a chair. Remember, these are straight razors. <laughs> That's Ralph's. Today it's Ralph's. Nice guy, you want a good cup of Green Mountain coffee? That's where to go. And that's Ralphson right there. Years ago, Jim Hushard, he was located in that building. He was an accountant, and then he got into real estate. And now I want you to look at the two other buildings to the left of Ralph's. Years ago, where the garage was, Mr. Hushard had his first business there. Then he moved next door. So it wasn't a garage at the time. And in the building to the right, I recall there was a beauty parlor in there. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a sign here. We now have a chiropractor that was in the house next to the garage, which is next to Ralph's. Uh, you're looking at an older picture of the house. That's quite a picture when you have the horse and buggy there. And, and as you can see, Ralph's had not moved at that point. Across the street from Ralph's, we have the Fleet Reserve building. That, at one time, was the post office. And was also doctor's offices in there. Now, some people have told me it could have been a hospital, our first hospital. Or maybe with the patients or the doctors, maybe they put them up overnight. Who knows? And, and it got misconstrued that it was a hospital. But I was, I'd never confirmed that it was a, indeed a hospital. Bacon Banjo, at their peak, they had approximately 45 to 50 employees. Interestingly, there are people throughout this country and other countries that are bacon banjo nuts. There is nothing better in the world than a bacon banjo. Uh, I did an article on this probably, probably 10 years ago. And there was a banjo called B and D, Bacon and Day. Fred Bacon, David Day. And by the way, David Day lived in my house, I found out. I, I wish I could find one of his banjos. If that, that banjo back in the 20s and 30s probably sold for around $500. If you have a very good one today that's in excellent condition, you could probably get thirteen dollars to $14,000 for it. That's how uh, wonderful that guitar was, or uh, banjo was. They also made guitars, and ultimately, when they went out of business, uh, Gretsch Guitar uh, bought them out. Those people that are really into bacon banjo would die to have that picture. That is from the newspaper. And I clipped that out, and I mailed it to a guy that's going to write a book on bacon banjo. I emailed it to him, and he came back immediately. Wow, what a find. Can we get the original? So I called on the London Day and spoke with John Ruddy, who is a reporter and also the historian type for the New London Day. And he said, unfortunately, this photograph appeared in the edition of June 5, 1937. He said, we did not start archiving until 1944, so this picture does not exist. This is the only picture that's available of this. Very unusual to see a picture of the front of the house with the sign on the right that says Bacon Banjo. I recall bidding on eBay of a picture of four people standing at a, on a sign, in front of a sign, without the house in it. 
that said Bacon Banjo. And I believe they were on the board of directors. I stopped at $30, and it went for $201 for one picture. That's what I say. People would die for that picture. And this is what it looks like today. I want to point out the side porch because I have a great picture. This is where they produced the banjos in the back. The building's still there. Uh, Horace Newberry uh, and I went through there with a couple of people from Massachusetts that are also into bacon banjos. There isn't much left in there. Uh, I do want to get some divers to go down underneath in the water because they, there was a, a hatch. And what they would do with the, with the ivory, after they, they'd throw the pieces down into the ground and little pieces of gold would go down and, into the hatch. So if you're a diver, and if, if the horse will let you, you can go down there and maybe get some goodies. There's part of the work crew. And there's Frederick Bacon. And you see over here is Mr. Bacon. And next to him is Mr. Day. Now, interesting, the guy that's going to write a book on Bacon Banjo. Last week sent me a list of all the workers. And he's missing a few. They went out of business in 1938. The hurricane pretty much uh, cleaned them out as far as the damage was concerned. Uh, but again, Gretsch bought them and continued making bacon uh, banjos. It's a familiar location. This is on the corner of Thames Street and Latham Street. When the construction started to redo Thames Street, the city made this into a parking area to kind of provide parking relief uh, while the construction was going on. It's still there. That's what used to be there. The Ebenezer Avery House, wounded soldiers from the Revolutionary War from the Battle of Fort Grizzle were brought here and cared for for a while. And then they ended up renting it out. Uh, you're looking at a picture that was probably taken around 1980. Ultimately, it was dismantled and numbered board by board and then moved to Fort Grizzle, where it was put back together again. It did an excellent job of it. For those that aren't aware, after it was moved, a gentleman named uh, Andy Delora, he lived in the, that house there, and he built a gazebo on the corner. So we had a gazebo down there on, on Day Street. It was quite interesting. He moved to Florida. That deteriorated. And there was always a brass sign mounted right here. And after the third time it was stolen, we bought the stone that nobody steals now to commemorate the area that's there. And there's Horace Newberry's house. At that point, but as you can see, the siding's being redone. There's an older photograph of it. And if we go back before this one, this was the Horace Newberry house. Interesting, in this particular area, next to the house, is the Fort Grizzle POW Memorial Park. People pass that every day and are not aware of the significance of that particular park. And it didn't, it didn't exist until about the mid-70s, but it was to honor the 38 patriots of the uh, Battle of Fort Grizzle who were taken prisoners right, and released down in New York. That's where the park is, right in this area here. This here, the Newberry Beach. At one point, this was one of three or four areas, the borough of Groton or the city of Groton was considering for their beach. Thank goodness they didn't select this compared to what we have at, at the Eastern Point Beach. Uh, but it was a nice area, a very nice area. Right across the street, this is the mosque. It was the uh, Episcopal Church. It was a synagogue. Uh, there was a dance studio there. That's a photograph when it was the church. And I'm going to switch back and forth. You notice that the door is on the front here. But originally, it was on the side. And this is Fort Street. You notice the dirt roads and the dirt sidewalks. And you notice Fort Street didn't go all the way up. There's a path that goes up from about the end of the rectory at the end of the church. This is the city filtration plant located next to the Memorial Park that was once going to be a beach. And interesting, this is what was there. That's the views you had before the filtration plant was there. So all those lovely souls that owned the houses across the street were a little upset. And you can see the trolley tracks going down the street. This is an aerial view showing that same area. And it's not too long ago. This was taken back in the 80s, 90s. You see the filtration plant. The park is not located here at that point. Now we have condos over in here. We have condos over in here. So things have changed considerably. The city in the last five years has purchased a lot of the property, pretty much all of this and all of this. 
as the Biles funeral home a couple months ago and went to the cemetery and Donnie says, you want to ride with me? I says, no, you're the last person I'm going to ride with. <laughs> uh, but they had an addition uh, placed on that and this is what the house looked like before the addition was placed on it. But it's a mom and pop small business. This is the area that the city recently purchased. This is the wall they uh, just installed about a year ago. Fortunately today it's now paved. Right, for those that have driven down Thames Street recently, it, it's, it's to be expected. We have construction. You've got to expect that. Uh, but in the last couple of days, they temporarily paved it over. They have some more work they have to do next year to finish up the project. But that's what it looked like before. Uh, this is when Costa owned it. And that's the Moxley House. In talking with uh, Eddie Costa, who did some research on it also, that house may have been brought from New London over by a barge. Now, if you look down, there's the house there sitting by the top of the street. This was the final location of the lobster pound. That's where the cost has had their lobster pound. The lobster pound building is not in this photograph, uh, but there it is uh, prior to it being torn down. And that's uh, Eddie Coster and Manny Coster. Manny started the business selling fish out of the back of a car and ended up with a major business that was selling lobster and fish from the New York border to the Rhode Island border and had several employees also. And at peak, he had about 23 to 25 employees. That's across the street from the Lobster Pound. This is where Judge Willard lived. And Judge Willard had the, his office in the house across the street, that little house. Um, and I'm about ready to write an article because uh, I have a great photo of Judge Willard when there was a one-day strike at Electric Boat, a sit-down strike at Electric Boat. And, and 14 or 15 people got arrested, and uh, he released them on bond. Of course, he worked there himself. Then we're going to move across the street from that building, and we have the old Groton Utilities building. This is pretty much what it looked like when it first opened. 1908 is when that building was constructed, and that's five years after the borough at the time purchased the water and electric company, and that's what generated the the borough and the city of Groton. Uh, their fathers were, the forefathers were smart enough to realize that this was a very fruitful, fruitful business. The utility building, or the utilities was downstairs and below, and the police station was up above. Uh, there's the utility crew on the side of the building with their vehicles and their names. And this is the police department, Marden Technology. This was our computer. This is a teletype. Right? And all your stolen cars and missing persons information would come off in sheets of paper. And these are our portable radios. <laughs> you can see the microphone here. Uh, and this was our computer also, the typewriter. Mike Spellman from the library gave me this calendar a few weeks ago. And it's part of my collection, which is going to end up at the library anyway. But I was very happy to receive that 1939 calendar from Groton Electric. Next door to the utility building, at one time, for approximately 10 years, we had another sightseeing attraction. Frank Sheets had brought in a diesel submarine. It would have tours on it. The municipal building had now moved out of here. They moved to their present location up on uh, Meridian Street. So the building was sold. And down here, they had a restaurant and a souvenir shop for the submarines. The club was called Club 246, rightfully so, for the submarine. And as you can see, we had everything. Not only sea submarines by boat, but we had seaplanes that would come in and take people for rides. And it was quite an attraction, quite an attraction. At that time, the present submarine memorial was not as active as it is now. In fact, I believe it was up toward the submarine base, toward Navy housing, before they moved it down to its location right now. But they would uh, traverse between here and the uh, Nautilus Museum. And unfortunately, uh, the owner did not have the money for upkeep and repair of this. Uh, so it, it went its way. The, uh, the military or the Navy took it back. This is the L&M doctor's offices. And there's four or five uh, medical facility offices in there. That's what it used to look like. Can you imagine having a satellite dish that size in, on your house today? <laughs> now, across the street from the L&M doctor's offices. Garbo now has his place, and there's a parking lot next to it. 
a lot of people took locations, bought the buildings, bought the houses, tore them down, had blacktop put down so they could rent for vehicle parking for electric boat. That's when electric boat down here had 20, 22,000 employees and they had the parked in places. And there was money to be made. Prior to that though, we have Rudy's Texaco station and there was a house located next to it. Now, Rudy's is Rudy Santa Cruz of Rotten Oil, which is now owned by his son, John. And that's what Rotten Oil used to be. After that older station, this was constructed and well, it wasn't the birth of Groton Oil, because I believe his father started it out of his house on Baker Avenue. And there's Rudy on the, on the left. And I always point out that. 22 cents a gallon. I don't think we'll ever see that again. In the back of that station, and you can see the old station now. There's the old station, and there's that house I pointed out. It was this area here. And it was actually a junkyard. Now we're going to look where Danielle's barbershop is, and there's a tattoo parlor. Uh, Dwayne Rue owns this one here. He and a, another gentleman tried a, a lobster business for a while, selling lobsters, and it just didn't take off. So he's presently using that for storage. This is the old Costa's fish market. There's what it was back in the 60s. And you had M. Costa's son, the fish market, the Carlos shoe repair. And then Macy's Barbershop, and standing in front of Macy's, Andy Shabelli. Andy Shabelli, by the way, used to keep track of every member, every graduate of Fitch High School. And the library now has several uh, albums of it uh, with their photographs, the class pictures, and then had their names, and he kept track of it. This is when they were building the store that Dwayne Rue was in. I won't say, you know, it comes around and goes around. <laughs> But where the tattoo parlor is, that's the gospel church. It moved from there up to the five corners, and now they're up on Tollgate Road now. Yeah. So they've come a long way. That's where the uh, riverfront uh, children's facility is. Prior to that, though, it was the Groton Convalescent Home. They had quite a business there. Andreola ran it. That's Groton's first bank, Groton Bank and Trust. I have other pictures of this, but I, I, I include this one because of this here. They used to boast about the fact that they were so modern that they had a walk-up window. Not a drive-up window, a walk-up window. There's a vacant lot next to that. Years ago, it was J and R service station. John and Rudy Santa Cruz. That's where he started out, right there. But interestingly, that same area, this is an 1868 map. If you look at it, you can see what it says there. Granite quarry. That's where the quarry was. And by the way, there was also a brewery down there. I used to go down to the quarry. I never found an empty bottle or a full bottle. I wish I had, I guess. But John Salter ran the quarry. And this is a receipt from John Salter and his son. You can look at the price. It's almost giveaway compared to today's rates. 80 cents an hour. 1921. Now, there's the quarry. There's an aerial photograph of the quarry. This is Baker Avenue. This is Allen Street. This is Thames Street down here. And now you can see the quarry. And the quarry started at the top near Smith Street and Allen Street and went all the way down to Thames so they could bring the granite that they quarried down to the ships to have it transported. When the railroad cars were brought by ferry from New London to Groton, this is the turnaround, and you can see the railroad cars here. And that's right at the split at Electric Boat. And we'll move down a little bit further. This house that exists there now, at one time, was a pink petal hairdressing studio, and Fasconi's tailor, Ray Fasconi, ran that, and he ultimately moved across the street from the submarine base. Now, we have this. Stairs to nowhere. And everybody walks down the street. Well, I wonder what used to be there. Another house. That's what used to be there. See that building? That's the old Appy's restaurant. And there's Appy's restaurant right there, right? right here. So there's the house on the corner that, where those stairs are. Stairs to nowhere, too. Right? You notice there's a set of stairs here and two sets of stairs here. This went into this house here, still does. So there's the first set of stairs. 
there's another business here. And there's two sets of stairs. They belong to this rooming house. This all came from an aerial shot that was taken around 1932, 33. So those are the stairs to nowhere. Now you know what was there. And you can picture those uh, facilities. On the corner, we have the r restaurant. They serve hot food, whatever it is. Well, that's what it used to be. Mr. Wells' grandson ran that. At one time, there was a Groton print shop there. This is out of an advertisement. There's been other businesses there. Mr. Levesque ran an electrical store there, Triborough Electric. And next to it, that's the stairs to nowhere. That was James and Sons. James and Son, they called it the waiting room, or the trolley stop, or trolley waiting room, because there was a stop down there. He closed and moved up to Paquanic Road. Now they call it Buford's. After James and Son, they opened up Hazel's Snack Shop. Now, this is not the end of Thames Street. Everybody thinks that this is where it ends, right here. Jones's Plumbing is there, 572 Thames Street. That's across Smith Street, right here. All right. 576 and 578 Thames Street. Remember the hot food restaurant is right there. There's Smith Street, and Perry Santa Cruz had a pool hall down here. We used to go in the pool hall. This is all now part of that parking garage uh, for Joneses. There's Joneses, 572. There's 576, the pool hall. And there's 578. This is John Street that now goes up across the street from Electric Boat, and I believe that's where Thame Street ended, where John Street came up. Now, all roads lead to one of the best towns in the country, and that's Groton. Thank you.